I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. A new presidential administration will be coming in in January. That's in the news quite a bit. Some of the shifts and changes globally, perhaps not so much in the news in this country. And the big question on my mind this week is, will it be a case of meet the new era, same as the old era? And a uh, person I always look forward to speaking with uh, and receiving insight from is my next guest, Professor Richard Wolf. You know him as the host of, of uh, Economics uh, Update, of, I mean, not just, yeah, Economic Update on Free Speech TV on Tuesday evenings. Uh, you, you can find much of his work at democracyatwork.info, Professor Emeritus, University of Massachusetts Amherst, also visiting professor at, uh, at the New School in New York, and his latest book on COVID and capitalism is entitled The Sickness is the System. So first of all, Richard Wolf, thank you for coming back on the program. Thank you, RJ. I'm glad to be here. Uh, let's start with this. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, global events, global economic events, even military events, don't seem to get the attention uh, in this country from the media that they uh, and the public perhaps as they deserve. And so let's start there. Um, China, we don't talk that much about China. I've talked a bit on this program and in my writing about uh, what I consider needless military provocation of China and the South China Sea, uh, and that sort of thing. But economically, uh, China appears to be on the rise, as you well know. Uh, that ascent seems to continue. We do not seem to be in this country so much on the rise. Uh, first of all, is that impression correct? Absolutely. Both impressions. The impression that this is not uh, understood or accepted or recognized in the United States and that it is in fact going on, which is a scary and dangerous proposition for the United States. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the economic implications, because, you know, people worry about uh, to the extent that it comes up at all. You know, I think perhaps people get a little xenophobic and so on or a lot xenophobic. But economically, there is a major shift underway. China is developing trade alliances and so on. Uh, but you understand this far better than I do. So is China, in effect, building its own global economic system that's challenging ours? Yes, I think that basically sums it up. Let me, let me just focus on three specific areas. Uh, one as new as last week, and one as old as the last 25 years. So let's start with the one last week. A new free trade uh, agreement was reached by the People's Republic of China and 14 other Asian countries, uh, including Japan, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea. In other words, many of the major economic players in the Pacific, with the notable exceptions of the United States on one end and India on the other. These 15 countries that signed this deal account for a, a, almost a third of the trade of the world, a third of the output of the world. In other words, this is an enormous economic zone. They, excuse me, have pledged to reduce tariffs to zero amongst themselves, essentially producing a common market that mm -hmm. will go a long way towards stimulating trade between them, trade that might otherwise have been with the United States or India or Europe. Uh, this is a sign that the, those countries in, that used to be U.S. allies, Japan, Australia, South Korea, New Zealand, and I could go on, are now recognizing that there is an alternative economic powerhouse mm -hmm. and that they must pay attention to it. They must enter into agreements with it. And it's therefore only a matter of time before the United States is iced out 
of more and more economic activities just as it was iced out of this uh, agreement. And to, to, to ignore that, to pretend that it isn't happening, and to pretend that it doesn't have enormous implications for the future of the world economy and the United States in it is a kind of self-imposed blindness that does not augur well. Let me give you a second okay. evidence. The United States is the largest debtor country in the world. In other words, as a society, the United States owes people outside of itself, foreigners, more money than any other country in the world, and nobody's close. Together, here's the second aspect of this fact. The largest creditor of the United States, that is the country whose institutions from the government on down have lent to the United States more than any other country, is the People's Republic of China. That's right. They are the creditor. The United States is the debtor. And you know one of the things that means, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here for our more conservative uh, friends. It means that this debt, which is in somewhere between one and two trillion dollars, uh, debt owed by the U.S. to China, it means that interest has to be paid every year on that debt, like any other, which means that, get ready now, tens of billions of dollars are raised by the United States government every year by, among other things, the taxes you and I pay. And that money is collected in Washington by the government and then turned over tens of billions to the Chinese as interest on their debt. So notice, when the President Trump said, I am going to pass this rule or punish that company because it is in some way maybe helping the Chinese military. Here's this sarcastic joke. The biggest assist to the Chinese military was Mr. Trump by co collecting and delivering interest payments every year of his presidency, as indeed previous presidents had to do to cover the interest cost of the indebtedness of the United States, which, by the way, was markedly increased over the last two and a half years, especially. And now here's the third. Okay. Over the last, yeah, you know, it's a little heavy, but I mean, if you don't pay attention- Yeah, keep going, we, we can take yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> okay, over the last 25 years, that's a quarter of a century, the People's Republic of China, their GDP, the rough measure of the total output of goods and services, has grown at a rate, on average, three times faster than the growth of that total output here in the United States, which is why, over the last quarter century, China went from one of the poorest countries in the world to an economic powerhouse, second only to the United States, and rapidly catching up and overtaking the United States unless something drastic changes. Now, 25 years ago, when this number became known, it was poo-pooed by people in the West, in the United States. You can't trust Chinese statistics. This is just done for political purposes. They're massaging the numbers, all of that. And who knows? I mean, I'm no, I have no privy to what goes on in China. Is that possible? Sure it is. Most countries play around with their statistics. Why should we assume that the Chinese don't? But a rule of thumb for economic historians, of which I am one, is that you can do that for a year. You can even do it for five or six. You can't do it for 25 years because if you keep announcing economic growth and it isn't visible after 10 or 20 years, in a sense, the game is up. If you go to China now or if you look at any statistic, you'll quickly see that all the evidence is there that this was in fact the case. And it has been confirmed now by the United Nations, by most international organizations that I'm aware of, who now basically take Chinese statistics
from their government pretty much the way they do from every other government. Okay, most of the world, the rest of the world is relatively poor. The country that grows fastest in the world for the last 25 years is the People's Republic of China. No other country comes close for anything like a comparable long period of time. Bottom line, this is an ascending power, China. Mm -hmm. It is not going to be held back by the United States any more than the United States was held back by Great Britain after our independence was achieved politically and economically. There are two options facing the United States. Work out a peaceful coexistence with China or continue the aggressive imposition of tariffs, trade wars, arresting executives, banning investment, uh, all of the things that the Trump administration did. And let's be clear, nothing has changed in China. If those were steps taken to get the Chinese to, to demote the Communist Party, it didn't happen. To change their basic economic structure, it didn't happen. To change their economic policy, it didn't happen. To dissuade other countries from doing business with China, it didn't happen. Failure, 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 failure. To not recognize all of this and change your policy, that is in itself a, a sign that the United States is a frustrated, declining power and is going to have the same outcome that the British had in relationship to their once colony, the United oh. States. <laughs> so, and again, we're talking with economist Richard Wolf. So that obviously brings up the question of what a wise and sound policy would be. And to talk about that, let me just synthesize a little bit, make sure I understood everything here. So first of all, we're talking about an alliance of the Pacific countries representing roughly a third of global trade or the third of the global economy, uh, which, which to me sounds like a tectonic shift because it seems to me that that is equivalent to a European Union, but without the close historic military and economic relationships, NATO and so on, uh, as uh, that we've had with European countries. So that to me, number one, huge. Number two, we've got this creditor relationship with China, which means when, for example, Richard, well, when the House Armed Services Committee votes as it recently did to appropriate $3.9 billion to threaten the Chinese in the South China Sea next year through various forms of military exercise, new weaponry, aid to India and other countries. We are in effect arming both sides, one side with our military budget, the other side with our interest payments. I'm going to throw all this back at you, you decide what you respond to. As far as the growth in GDP, that China has experienced. The thought I couldn't, I can't resist mention, is that the sort of handmaidens and apologists for neoliberalism, the Steven Pinkers of the world, Bill Gates's of the world, love to point out that global poverty is decreasing, global income is increasing. Now I know that's flattened or perhaps even reversed, but my understanding is if you take China's growth out of that, that's not even true. So China is expanding, poverty elsewhere is stagnating. I mean, I could say more, I could go on, but those are my initial thoughts. And that of course leads us to, well then, what in the world do we do about this? Well, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think your, your points amplify those I was trying to make. They are all in fact correct and have been pointed out by countless commentators who have looked at this situation with something other than uh, America first bifocals. Uh, so here we are, what are we going to do? It's a little bit like the old conundrum. You can stay with the old way. The irony is the old way, the return to normal, which is the mantra of the Biden campaign, and indeed the mantra of all those around him that advise him, that is to go back to what exactly led us to the situation with China and led us 
to Mr. Trump. So if it, it seems to me if I listen to Mr. Biden and if I were an advisor to either Mr. Trump or whoever the next Mr. Trump will be, mm -hmm. this is good news. They're going to go back to business as usual. They're going to react against Mr. Trump's departures. I see Mr. Trump's economic nationalism, his refusing to participate in the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, back when he just became president, his withdrawal from the World Health Organization, from the Paris Climate Agreement, and so on. This is an America first nationalist direction that the rest of the world is uninterested and unwilling to pursue. Even the absurd right-wing leaderships of places like uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil or Orban in Hungary, they, they don't have the options the United States does anyway because they're much poorer countries, but they're not daring to go in an economic nationalist direction other than through verbiage and I'm not interested in that. They're desperate to hold on to the positions they have in world trade, including, ironically, trade with China. So I think the real choice here is an America go it yourself, go it alone, uh, versus an America willing to make real deals, which means you have to give up something to get something. The United States and China have been collaborating. That's why the Chinese agreed to lend all that money to the United States, etc. Uh, they found ways to collaborate. The Chinese have done more with them than the United States, but that probably would have happened anyway. In any case, the only alternative to that is a economic warfare, which has a nasty habit in human history of becoming military warfare. And the Chinese have two things Americans ought to remember. Number one, they have their own nuclear weapons. And number two, their population is four times the population of the United States. This is not military activity with Iraq or Afghanistan, incredibly poor countries with tiny populations by comparison. No, no, no. This is now a rich country with a nuclear armament, uh, tight alliances with a dozen countries, and not poor, and with a population, as I say, of 1.2 to 1.3 billion people, four times that of the United States. Uh, it is lunacy to continue uh, down that path. My hope is and that's all it is, is a hope, is that some brains will prevail in the Biden administration that will decide that the political risks of this kind of collision course with the People's Republic of China is not worth it, and that the damage is not worth it, and that a real change in the United States is what is needed. The Chinese have signaled over and over again that they would prefer working these things out, which, by the way, makes sense since they're doing real well working things out with the United States. That's why they don't want to change. They want to make deals. That's why they were so measured in their responses to each and every provocation from Mr. Trump. But to be honest with you, RJ, I don't expect it. I noticed that Mr. Biden felt it politically appropriate to refer to the leader of the People's Republic of China in a campaign speech late in the campaign as, and I quote, a thug, T-H-U-G. Wow. Is that necessary? Do you need to do that? Do you imagine that that doesn't have an impact on the Chinese people? A thug. And what was the evidence? Abuse of the folks in Hong Kong and abuse of the Uyghur minority uh, in part of China. That qualifies as a thug. What then does one do with Mr. Biden, who is now inheriting a government that has waged war on Muslims in four countries that I know of? 
Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Libya, killing way more people than anyone has charged the Chinese with doing to their Muslim uh, opponents or enemies or adversaries, if you want. I mean, what in the world is going on here? Are you going to allow the pandering to the right wing in this country to dictate your policy with the most powerful economic force emerging in the world today? That's the real issue. And I'm wondering whether the Biden administration will dare to face it squarely or honestly. And again, Richard Wolf, uh, a couple thoughts. First of all, you know, uh, uh, this conversation is shaking my confidence in Bill Clinton and the centrist wing of the Democratic Party. Um, that's irony, by the way. That's a sarcasm. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So here's the deal. So we have uh, Bill Clinton signing the, World Tr the WTO agreement. Some million manufacturing jobs go to China. China says, thanks for the jobs, uh, forms a new alliance elsewhere. We are not willing to come, apparently, to come to the table with them. So we can't, for example, structure an agreement that might create rather than take jobs in the United States. Meanwhile, that deal has enriched many people, probably among them Bill Clinton. And, uh, and so we forge ahead on this misguided road. Uh, and rather than address, uh, th th actually, this is, I think, where I'm going. In the 2016 election, people here in Washington, D.C. kept telling me, ah, people, voters don't really care about free trade. And I would just say, you ought to go to my hometown, Utica, New York, where you can see signs against the TPP, where you can see signs against these, uh, you know, these bad trade deals for American workers. So, re uh, you know, my read is that Joe Biden calls, I think pandering is a fair word, when he calls uh, when he calls the leader of China a thug. And I think it's because the Democrats don't have a credible agenda that says, here's how we want to work and trade and function on the world stage in, in a way that serves the interests of the majority in a way that says you will have jobs, you will not be exploited, you will not be outsourced. There's, I mean, it's a very complex question, of course, and I'm oversimplifying it, but balancing that, in other words, when we don't have a rational system of economic democracy here at home, of de democratic economic dipl diplomacy worldwide, we open ourselves up to the kind of uh, deceptive uh, and uh, xenophobic economic populism of the Steve Bannons of the world. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? Absolutely. And it, it's an amazing uh, con that has been played on the American working class. Obviously, if you allow corporations to close the factories in Utica, New York, or mm -hmm. for that matter, in my hometown, Youngstown, Ohio, exact same thing happened. If you allow corporations simply to shut those factories and to move production to China where they can pay a much lower wage, that's wonderful for their profits. But it's a disaster for the workers who lose their jobs in Utica and Youngstown, for their families, for the communities that lose the tax payments and cannot provide public services just when people need them more than ever. That's a disaster unquestionably, why you allow corporations for the private profit of their shareholders to do the kind of social damage that you can see any day of the week driving through what used to be industrial Ohio or what used to be a corridor from Albany to Buffalo in upstate New York. If you did that, you would understand the grotesque and utterly unnecessary failure here. Those corporations who made the decision to go abroad and did it to make more profits could have and should have been subject to taxation on a good part of that profit. Why? That could have been used 
to provide very useful public sector jobs to any and every worker deprived of an income, deprived of a job by a private profit driven decision of a corporation. If you think to yourself for one minute, had the Democratic Party made a commitment to provide public employment for the unemployed in exactly the way that Democratic President Franklin Roosevelt was forced to do in the 1930s, they would have had the program you referred to, RJ. They would have been able to go to the working class and they would have gotten the votes and the anger at the private companies that brought on this disaster would have gotten the Republicans that anger lopped on them and the Democrats would have been seen as the savior of the working class. And the reason I'm confident in making that prediction is that's exactly what happened in the 1930s. President Roosevelt created a public jobs program to absorb the people laid off. His reward was being reelected three times, something no president ever had happened to him before. Uh, he's the most popular president, according to voting, that this country has ever had. The one who dared to do what today's Obamas or Trumps don't do. Babble about, but they don't do it. So, uh, Richard Wolf, I guess uh, where I'd, I, I'd love to go now, perhaps as our you know final act here in this, is when I listen to this, as we have this conversation, I can only, I'm trying to imagine, you know, pathways of what will happen in the future. I basically only see two. And let me tell you what they are, because maybe I'm missing some, uh, maybe not. One of them, is a future where we, in this country, fundamentally change the way we do a number of things, including uh, our approach to global trade and global relationships, massively downscaling our military presence around the world, uh, entering an era of genuine co cooperation where we understand that despite the post-Cold War fantasies to the contrary, we do not and will not live in a unipolar world where we are the sole superpower. And we make our decisions uh, democratically, as I mentioned earlier, based on the best interests of all, which ultimately should include the best interests of workers in other countries as well, so that our interests are in harmony. That's future scenario number one. Future number scenario two is we cling uh, in, in near panic uh, to the course we're on, uh, becoming, in the words of the late Richard Nixon, a pitiful, helpless giant until at some point we're not so giant anymore and we remain pitiful and helpless, gradually taking on water, gradually losing global influence uh, and um, descending into some sort of economic black hole. Uh, am I thinking too simplistically or too apocalyptically here? No, I think this kind of conversation, including its apocalyptic, sorry, visions is what we need to have. We are not in good shape. The inequality in this country, the racial divisions, the regional divisions, I mean, uh, the instability. We are now going through a catastrophic public health failure. A uh, rich country like us, not prepared for the virus, not able to contain the virus, and going through an economic crash of our capitalist economy. I mean, Everyone has that sense. We're being overwhelmed. We can't handle it. Well, if your problems are extraordinary and the degree of difficulty in dealing with them is extraordinary, it's a big fat hint that your responses better be extraordinary. And let's make no mistake. Mr. Trump and Mitch McConnell and the Republicans took extraordinary steps, politically daring steps to go way to the right, questions of white supremacy, questions of evangelicalism, and so on. They went beyond. That's why they lost the support of the Romneys and the Bush family, and so on. They were extreme, and their vote went up from 2016 to 2020, despite all the extremes 
that they went. The left, the response of the Democratic Party has not been to do something comparable on the left. They had to reject uh, Bernie Sanders. They had to reject a whole host of, of possible directions for something as, how shall I say it politely, as moderate as uh, Joe Biden. This is not smart. Going back to that is not what you want to do. Anyway, well, I have run, I have run out of time, sir. I, I do have to go. Uh, no I problem. would love, as always, to continue this conversation with you, RJ. We will, sir. And please have a good afternoon. We will let you go. And thank you so much, as always, Richard Wolf, economist. And we will be right back after this. I am Richard RJ Escal, and this is the Zero Hour. Thank <laughs> you.